Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. But the Tom Crean era is over. And with that said, it is officially time to start talking about who could be the next head coach at Georgia, okay? Who could be the next guy to take over at Georgia? And what I would say is is a couple things. One, I think it's a very interesting time for Georgia to be making a hire, okay? It's funny, I actually went on SEC, uh, the SiriusXM SEC channel earlier this week, and one of the co-hosts that day was Aaron Murray, the former Georgia quarterback. And it was funny, he was kind of picking my brain, like, who do you think, what would you do, blah, 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 this and that. And what I did say, and we'll get to candidates just here in in just half a second, but I want to set this up because I think it's important. When you talk about the SEC right now, this second, you look at a group of coaches that are not only elite, but elite in a lot of different areas, right? Like there are coaches in college basketball, and I've talked about this on different podcasts and all this stuff before, that don't like to recruit, that hate the portal, that don't don't want to, whatever whatever it is, don't want to focus on scheduling, don't care about this, don't care about that. You go to the SEC, oh, there's a lot of coaches in that league that check in awful lot of boxes, that love to recruit, that get the portal, that find the balance between high school repu- recruiting and portal recruiting, that know the X's and O's, that are good in front of boosters. I mean, think about the coaches in the SEC right now. Bruce Pearl at Auburn checks a lot of boxes. Rick Barnes at Tennessee checks a lot of boxes. Eric Musselman at Arkansas checks a lot of boxes. John Calipari's an all-timer, checks all the boxes. Uh, Nate Oates, really good rising coach despite a little bit of a disappointment this year, checks a lot of boxes. And so I bring it up because I just think this is such a fascinating deal for Georgia where you could get away with some stuff maybe three, four, five years ago when you hired Tom Crean. You can't now. You got to get a guy that checks all the boxes. And so with that said, let's get into the candidates because I do think it's going to set up an interesting conversation about some of the candidates, why I like some of them more than others. The first candidate, the name that has picked up a ton of traction over the last couple weeks is Jonas Hayes, uh, and a current assistant coach at Xavier. And many of you are asking, why the heck would an assistant coach at Xavier be the lead candidate for the Georgia job? And it's pretty straightforward. This is a guy that basically bleeds, you know, black and red, Georgia black and red. Played at Georgia. He is the brother, the twin brother of Jarvis Hayes, who played in the NBA forever and is a former Georgia Bulldog himself. He was a former assistant coach at Georgia. He he has recruited Georgia for years. As a matter of fact, if you look at Xavier, as much of a frustrating season as it's been, if you look at their roster, they have a ton of kind of southern and southeast players on the roster, including Dewan Odom, who's a really good player for him. He comes from Georgia, and it was Jonas Hayes who was the one that recruited him. And that is kind of the idea behind why you go get Jonas Hayes. He is a guy that has deep, 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 deep ties to the state of Georgia. He is a guy that knows the AAU coaches, the high school coaches, the alums, the boosters, the former players. And he is the guy that can bring everybody together under one roof and make Georgia basketball into what they hope that they can be. And so that is why he's the lead candidate. I have seen some stuff. I haven't heard it personally, but I saw like Matt Norlander from CBS Sports put this out there, is that there's kind of a lot of internal pressure on the AD, Josh Brooks, to kind of bring in this guy. There's a lot of people in the program that want him. And so it'll be interesting to see if he ends up being the guy. What I would also say is in terms of why I would be a little bit concerned if I was a Georgia fan, it's for the reason I just mentioned. The guy has never been a head coach at any level. And it's not to say that you can't be successful as a head coach in college basketball if you've never been a head coach before, right? Like Tommy Lloyd at Arizona might be the national player, national coach of the year this year. But what I would also say, there's a big difference between taking over Arizona with a future lottery pick in Ben Matherin, and he would have been drafted last year, by the way. Arizona's probably the best job in that league by far, maybe the best job west of Lawrence, Kansas, and taking over a Georgia job, which is going to have by far the worst roster when you inherit it. And then on top of that, you're in a much tougher league and a job that is much further down the scale in terms of the league itself. And so that would be my concern with taking Jonas Hayes. I'm not saying it can't work. I'm not saying that a first-year head coach has never been able to walk in and do the job well. But I do think there's a difference between being a first-year head coach in college basketball and being a first-year head coach 
at Georgia in the SEC when the SEC maybe has the strongest coaches it's ever had and maybe the strongest coaches in college basketball right now. Again, Eric Musselman checks all the boxes. John Calipari checks all the boxes. Nate Oates checks all the boxes. Bruce Pearl, Rick Barnes, on and on. And so to me, that'll be the very interesting thing. Do you go with the guy with zero experience because of what he could potentially do for the community or do you go in another direction? And so with that said, let's get to the next guy on the list and a guy that, frankly, I'll just be blunt, he'd be my choice. And that is Dennis Gates, the head coach at Cleveland State. And a lot of you probably sitting there saying, just like Jonas Hayes, Torres, Dennis Gates, Cleveland State, why are you going to go hire the head coach at Cleveland State? And what I would say is, first of all, while he has been at Cleveland State the last two years, this is a guy with major, major, major Southeast ties. He is a guy that coached under Leonard Hamilton for several, several, several years, about eight, nine years. He was Leonard Hamilton's lead assistant. And so he does have ties to the Southeast. He is a dogged recruiter, and he has done a great job at Cleveland State. He is a guy that came in in the middle of the summer, like late, late, late summer. I think he got hired in late June and took over one of the worst programs in major college basketball. Uh, 10 and 21 the year before he got there, 5 and 13 in the Horizon League. And people respected what he did so much that in year one, even though they only improved by a game or two, they finished at 11 and 21 overall. He actually won the conference coach of the year. Because the previous coach got fired, a bunch of guys left, and basically in June, on the fly, he came in and had to figure it out, and he actually, to his credit, did. Year two was last year, kind of the weird COVID-ish sort of year where a tournament got played in a bubble. Cleveland State, in just year two, under Dennis Gates, wins the conference regular season title, wins the conference tournament title, finishes last season, and again, it was kind of a weird COVID year. But last year, they finished 19-8 and overall, 16-4 and in the conference. And again, he wins the regular season conference title, makes the NCAA tournament. This year, even better, wins the conference regular season title, more wins, uh, you know, all that good stuff, 20-10 and overall. They did not make the NCAA tournament, losing in their conference semifinals. But when I look at a guy, when I look at a, a candidate for Georgia that checks all the boxes, the way that I believe Nate Oates did coming out of Buffalo, the way that I believe Eric Musselman did coming out of Nevada to Arkansas, Dennis Gates is the guy. And as a guy who knows maybe a little bit more about college basketball than most, he's the guy that I don't want going to Georgia, and here's why. One, an elite recruiter. Not going to let all those kids leave Georgia. Some are going to leave because when you get offered by Kentucky or you get offered by Auburn or Tennessee, it's always a great opportunity. You're going to take advantage of it. But He's a great recruiter, and more important, two, he's had success as a head coach, and then three, what I would say, and I do think this is an important element of it as well, I think he's done a good job of building a program at the mid-major level during this era of college basketball with the one-time transfer and all that good stuff, and to me, that is a very important element of all this, okay, and when it comes to all these jobs, and I don't even know how many are going to open this year, but that is something that I would be looking at as an AD, is that in this world where players can transfer all the time, anytime they want, are you a guy that's able to recruit kids into your program, develop them, and get them better and get them to stay in your program? Because I think that's a really important part of college basketball over the next 10 years. Is there are some, By the way, there are some coaches, Eric Musselman's one of them, that are great in the portal world and players coming and going. Chris Beard's another one. John Calipari is obviously one, whatever. But for the most part, When I look at a mid-major coach, that in the world that we live in, if a guy blows up as a mid-major player, really talented, all-conference type player, can you convince him to stay, or is he bouncing the second that he has a good season to go to a better job, to, to a better spot? If you bring in a kid and he doesn't play right away, is he transferring down? And that's simply not the case of Dennis Gates at Cleveland State, and I think that's important in this, in this one-time transfer world. If you can get kids to stay in your program, it means they have respect for you, they have respect for your staff, they believe in you, you probably have a pretty good personal relationship with them where you're obviously coaching them hard because you're having success, but they also trust you enough to stay in your program. And so that, to me, is what stands out about Dennis Gates, is he's not only won, but he's done it over a two, three, four-year stretch, and he's done it in a mid-major where he's been able to retain a big part of his roster. I think that is important as well. Beyond that... After, uh, let me even, we'll get to a couple other candidates in a minute. But what I would say really quick is a couple things. One, those are the two candidates that really seem to be out there, okay? Those are the two candidates that everyone seems to think are in the mix at the job. And after those two, there is a big gap with everybody else. So really, after those two, I'm just kind of speculating at this point, 
it obviously goes without saying, if uh, certainly if Jonas Hayes took uh, was offered the job, I'm certain he would accept it. I'm pretty sure Dennis Gates would take it as well. And so I just bring it up to say that it probably isn't going to get past those two. But if it does, I, I did put come together with a couple other names. And again, probably understanding that there is a big obvious two, and then below that, uh, it gets much, much more murky. One name, uh, it's a guy that, well, I'll be honest, you're going to hear from him in about 10 minutes or so, Matt McMahon, the Murray State head coach. And he's another one. And we talk about it. I said to him, Coach, how do you keep all these good players in your program every year? It's unbelievable. So with Matt McMahon, first of all, he has had sustained success at Murray State. And I know Murray State's a great job, and everybody that's gone there has won. But let's just look at the last five years for Murray State. 26-6, first in the league. 28-5, first in the league. 23-9, first in the league. That was the year the, the NCAA tournament was canceled. 13-13, and fifth in the league. And then this year, 30-2, first in the league. So basically, the only year that Murray State has not won the conference regular season title was the COVID year last year. And so I bring it up to say it's a lot of the same stuff that I just said with Dennis Gates. Uh, he's built a program. He's sustained success over a period of time. He's been able to keep good players in his program. He even mentions a couple names uh, here when he comes up on the show later in a little bit. He basically says point blank. He says, like, look, you know, it comes down to recruiting. It comes down to evaluation, all that stuff. But my two best players, K.J. Williams and Tevin Brown, if they wanted to go somewhere else, they could have and they would have had plenty of suitors. So that impresses me. And then I think the other thing that has to impress you if you're an outsider looking into his program, the guy's clearly got a good eye for talent. You know, I mean, they brought in some guy named John Moran about three, four, five years ago that really kind of blew up, I guess, late in his career, but wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't a, a superstar high school player. Matt McMahon, there's obviously uh, a lot of reasons to like his resume. As I said, in terms of being at Murray State, uh, four regular season titles in the last five years, 30 and two. And I do believe that if, if he does want to move up, I did not ask him about other coaching opportunities. If he does want to move up, I believe this year he will be in demand. A couple other names, you know, I'm just going to rip through a few of them. One, Lamont Paris, the head coach at Chattanooga. They're going to the NCAA tournament. We saw the buzzer beater there. Uh, have been really impressed by him, how he's built the program down there at Chattanooga. And then finally, what I would say, I've seen enough people reference it where I feel like I have to mention it, but we got to talk about potential friend of the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast, Sean Miller, down at, at Georgia. Now, when it comes to Sean Miller, it is important to note, he even really talked about this a little bit in his appearance a few weeks ago, is that when it comes to Sean Miller, the Arizona investigation is still ongoing, right? So as of right now, there is no new information. And as of right now, Arizona is not going to get its punishment until this summer. And so I think Sean Miller is realistic in the fact that he might not really be a candidate this coming cycle, but that also he does understand that he believes that his punishment will justify him being a candidate at some point, maybe as early as next year. But if you're Georgia, I'll say this. Like, I get crushed anytime I, I, I say anything nice about Sean Miller. Oh, you support him, you this, you that. Guy made seven Sweet 16s and eight Elite Eights. And at Arizona, where they expect Final Fours and National Championships, maybe that wasn't enough. But at Georgia, you could go to Georgia right now? I'm sorry, man. I'm making that call, and I'm seeing if Sean Miller will come. Now, you have to hire him knowing that he could be facing a suspension at some point. I do not believe it will be a lengthy suspension. I don't believe he's getting a show cause. Um, and so that's kind of the, the thing with Georgia is do you trust, uh, you know, do you trust him to not, not trust him, but do you trust the NCAA to kind of look at the case at Arizona and give him a fitting punishment? Because if you can deal with a four, five, six game suspension, whatever it ends up being, I'll tell you this, man, you get Sean Miller on the, on the low Sean Miller, a guy that has been to again, seven sweet 16s and five elite eights, four elite eights, whatever I just said, that's a good, good, good deal for your program. So yeah, so yeah, that's the Georgia deal. Went on long enough. I, I do want to wrap here on a couple other news and notes from across the carousel. By the way, I would say this. I think Dennis Gates or Jonas Hayes, those are the two guys. Those are the guys that are going to be the candidates there, and I think one of the two will get the job. I would go with Dennis Gates. I kind of get the sense that the pressure is on to bring back Jonas Hayes. Uh, would not surprise me, by the way, 